coconut. The Trek Geeks Podcast Network is proud to have Fansets as its presenting sponsor. Fansets is the place for amazing pin collectibles, with over 200 officially licensed Star Trek pins and new releases every single month. Stay tuned for a special discount code good on your next order at fansets.com just for Trek Geeks listeners. Fansets, our pins have character. This episode is also sponsored by Science Division, the makers of the world's first interactive Tribble that you can control with your smartphone. Find out more at sciencediv.com. Science Division. Trouble's never been this fun. We are the Borg, and you are listening to the biggest little show this side of the Alpha Quadrant. It's the Trek Geeks Podcast with Bill Smith and Dan Davidson. You will listen. Resistance is futile. You must comply. Sick Bay at Podfleet Command, where we're trying to use nanoprobes to cure the nastiest stuff on the planet. It's the biggest little show this side of the Alpha Quadrant and the flagship of the Trek Geeks Podcast Network. Greetings, ladies, gentlemen, children of all ages, and welcome to the Trek Geeks Podcast. I'm your co-host, Bill Smith. So great to have you here with us this week as we dive in on episode number 229. Wow. It's amazing that 228 other times I have introduced my co-host who, well, let's just say if he were infected with the same kind of gook that Harry Kim gets infected with, um, I'd probably find a better use for those nanoprobes. Yeah. He's the, uh, he's the largely uh, infected and communicable Dan Davids. And Dan, welcome aboard, buddy. We got a great one on tap today. covid <laughs> I think that's what Harry had, and that's what we're all going to end up being if we don't fix this. Hi. Wow. wow. So that, that got dark really quickly. <laughs> it, it did. It's good to be here. Thank you. I'm, I'm proud to have the 8472 uh, virus flowing through my veins, out my nose, in my ears. It's all, Ugh. it's all, it's fr- up to your shoulders. It really is kind of gross, and it kind of grows. It's like a, it's like a weed. Kind of like somebody you, get him a Kleenex. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's good to be here. 229 times you now introduced me. That is, Congratulations! I know it's not easy. I know you, no, don't I know it, brother? You gotta, you gotta use that little pea brain of yours to come up with these introductions. But you surprisingly do it every week, and I appreciate it. So thank you, thank you for being you, Bill. And a little inside baseball here on the Trek Geeks podcast. I don't write these out ahead of time. No, you don't. You don't. Um, these just happen. We tell. Um, we can spontaneously. Tell. Yeah. Uh, I don't think you're in any position to give me <laughs> crap, given your farcisms, which you do write out in advance and I now have a database of. They are now like I'm going to have to Amazon number. I, I can see it right now. In three years, the Amazon number one bestseller on the books list is going to be the Farcism Collection by Dan Davidson of the Trek Geeks Podcast Network. You heard it here first, people. What, you mean the Amazon? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, okay, let's let's reel it in. Let's get back to what we're talking about. We are here on episode 229 uh, as we continue our Voyager 25 celebration, which we've been having such a great time with this year, man. I got to say, because we can't be at the conventions uh, celebrating with the cast and all the people behind the scenes, why not just do it a lot here on the podcast? So so right now, we're going to uh, we're going to deep dive tonight into a two-parter. Season three ender cliffhanger and season four episode one introduced a new character to Voyager. We're talking Scorpion part one and two. Just the word Scorpion's kind of scary, isn't it? Scorpion. Your face is scary. Ooh, do it again. Okay, your Vasa. your face is scary. Yeah, I know that, but we're talking about Scorpion. We're not talking about. I'm not talking about me, Bill. I don't do that on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, <you> never. 
<laughs> you know, one of the things I love about Scorpion is that uh, it, it really leaves a lot in an uncertain place before the break. I mean, this is no best of both worlds. Well, you know, we're, no. we'll, we'll be candid about that. But we both call this a see it on the most recent see it or skip it. And deservedly so. I think it's a great cliffhanger for a season. But more about that later, my friend. Okay. As far as right now, you I'm sure there are... for me to do? I do, actually. I'm sure there are a bunch of people who want to hear your dulcet tones to find out where they may get in contact with us. Absolutely. Uh, if you're looking to get in touch with us, you can head right on over to trekgeeks.com slash contact, and you will find a whole bunch, a multitude of ways to communicate with Bill and I. Let's see. There's Skype chat. There's email. There's voicemail by way of that big blue button using SpeakPipe. So actually, there really isn't a multitude. There's really only three. But we're going to say multitude every week because that's the way we like to roll here on Trek Geeks. Uh, just you know, whichever way you want to contact us, make it so because we love hearing from you. Plus, there's also the most positive Trek Geek goop. Goop. This, <laughs> see, I'm still <laughs> thinking about discovering Trek Lower Decks and the Decon Chamber. <laughs> but, but you know what just happened? <laughs> yes, Your streak is over. It's over. It was at like five and now it's all done. Uh, there is the most positive Star Trek group on Facebook. It's called Camp Kittimer. It's our official group and it's where over 1,700 other friends gather to talk Trek. It is always positive and there's no bashing or gatekeeping ever allowed. To join the group, just head on over to Facebook.com slash groups slash Camp Kittimer. And be ready to be part of a truly wonderful social experience. And as always, we want to thank our wonderful admins, Haley, Jackie, and Dan, for the amazing job they do running the camp. Also, comments, you give them, we use them. That's the way it is. Bill. Wow, back to me. Yeah. Quick. That's a, that's a, do, do you need me to set up an appointment with a counselor so that you can get past this... Uh, this verbal faux pas you, you made during the uh, I, I kind of look at it as, as how cool it was in Picard where they had that sign in the board cube. It's a number of days since an assimilation. It's being wiped off and now it's at zero. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a feeling it's going to be at zero for a while. <laughs> And it's time for the news from treknews.net. News is irrelevant. You will be assimilated. Whoa. Sorry. So news. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Spanning the, the Delta Quadrant. <laughs> for all the news on all the Star Treks, yo. Dun, 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 dun. It's treknews.net. Dun, 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 dun. Online at treknews.net. I'm not sure. I think you changed keys in the middle I did. somehow. I, and okay. I'm glad you caught that because I did change keys. Yep. It happens. That's my, uh, it's, it's my ear. What can I say? I, I hear things. You hear these dulcet tones and you know, I just don't know what to do. Do you even know what that means? Uh, I thought it was an ice cream flavor once, but I'm not really sure. <laughs> First up in news, Dan. We were both over the moon when the new show uh, Strange New Worlds was announced. And this past weekend, it seems like uh, Star Trek executive Alex Kurtzman had some kind of update. Yeah, you know, we've, we've known about Strange New Worlds for a while, and um, uh, it's gotten, I, I gotta say, it's taken some time for me to digest this update, and, I got, and I'm really happy with it, actually. Um, Alex Kurtzman was participating recently in a Deadline Contenders uh, panel, promoting his Emmy nomination for Star Trek Short Treks, and he did give us an update regarding Strange New Worlds. Quote, I think Strange New Worlds, under the guidance of Henry Myers and Akiva Goldsman, is going to be a return in a way to TOS. We're going to do standalone episodes. There will be emotional serialization. There will be two-parters. There will be larger plot arcs. But it really is back to the model of an Alien of the Week, Planet of the Week, Challenge on the Ship of the Week. End quote. Now, don't get me wrong. I love the season-long story arcs that we've seen in Discovery and Picard, and even series-long ones with Deep Space Nine back in the day. But the idea of this Alien of the Week slash Planet of the Week is really sounding good to me the more I think about it, Bill. It's like Star Trek comfort food when you think about it. And I've used this analogy before in the past. As long as Spock doesn't, I don't know, have a container, break his spine, and then he gets surgery on it, but then next week he's out running laps, I'll be good with it. And I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, that that's a good point. Uh, Warfa recovers from that pretty really quick. fast. Yeah. Um, 
I, I think the only thing that gets me is that this is being treated as news. True. Um, because this is the thing that Star Trek fans have known since the series was announced. Yes. Um, yes. I think it's news to the deadline crowd and to people in Hollywood. And, but and maybe other it's more than that, confirmation. It, well, we knew it, but maybe now he's really saying this is what it's going to be. I don't know. I, I think at this point, he's just getting it out there. I mean, because really what people want to know is that it started production. Mm. Like v- actors before cameras. Very good point. Yep. Um, and, and I get it. He was there to promote short treks you know, in the Emmy nomination, which it deserves. Yep. Um, but unless he's bringing more to the table with Strange New Worlds, he teased us about it for long enough. Now it's time to put up. A big teaser. <laughs> An appetizer. Oh, I'm hungry. Dan, uh, up next, speaking of things that almost aren't news. <laughs> <laughs> I was really well, stretching this week, man. <laughs> William Shatner has been very busy on Twitter recently trolling various people and topics. But one tweet from a fan caught his attention and gave us some insight as to the the infamous question of whether or not we'll see him play Kirk ever again. Yeah, I, I, like like you just kind of, you know, hinted at, I'm really not sure that the Shat's Twitter feed is really worthy of news. Uh, but in any event, a fan did ask him if he would ever possibly see his Captain Kirk and Chris Pine's Captain Kirk together in an upcoming movie. And his reply was short and sweet, quote, Probably not, but I'm fine with that, end quote. Now, some people may say that that kind of response was that maybe he doesn't like Chris Pine, but that is not the case. At least it doesn't appear to be. Last month during a Galaxy Con live event, he was asked who he would want to play him in a biopic, and he actually suggested Chris Pine, saying he is, quote, a good-looking, talented guy. And then earlier in 2018, Shatner said of Pine, quote, he is so good and such a leading man, end quote. So maybe it means he's pretty much done with playing the legendary captain, as indicated by comments he made last March that he said uh, Kirk's story is pretty well played out. But then again in June, he said he would love to return to the role. So basically, I guess uh, what I'm trying to say is it's anyone's guess what he really means. He is and always will be a Star Trek legend. If we see him return to the role, that works. I'm fine with it. And if it doesn't happen, I guess I'm okay with it too, buddy. (laughs) Well, here's how I feel about this. In six months, in just over six months, William Shatner will be 90 years old. My God. 90. 90. He is not going to play Kirk again. Not even if they throw a boatload of money at him, which they are not going to do. Because Captain Kirk is dead on Viridian 3. That's true. Good point. Um, Could they bring him back? They could. But they also got Chris Pine that they can bring back. That's true. Um, So uh, as much as William Shatner is loved and revered and he has that iconic status, dude's 90. (laughs) He he ain't going to be Kirk anytime soon. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, I mean, this, is this really a news story? No, but it's something to talk about because you're always going to have people say, oh, my God, it'll be great. Oh, my God, he shouldn't do it. Whatever. I think that that William Shatner likes to be a provocateur of sorts. Oh, absolutely. I, I think he likes to say, no, I'm not coming back. Well, no, no, well. And I think he does that. Um, I can't say I blame him. I mean, he is his own chief export. I mean, mm-hmm. he, he is his product and yep. I get it. Um, and, and fandom, fandom turns out when he shows up, I get it. He, he is, and always will be Captain Kirk and people will always want him to sit in the captain's chair again. So. Oh, we'll go to Ticonderoga for that. I, I tell you what, if you want to yeah. see William Shatner and you want to see him sitting in the captain's chair, uh, the original series set tour up yeah. in Ticonderoga, New York is the place to go. Boom. Um, because you get to see him on the TOS bridge and it is, uh, it is amazing. Yes, it is. So, and finally, Dan, in news, it certainly should come as no surprise, but another major convention has been canceled due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, not surprised at all, man. Unfortunately, another great convention has fallen victim to this pandemic and the pitiful handling of it here in the United States. Uh, Convention organizer Reed Pop has announced that due to the ongoing coronavirus pandemic, the physical New York Comic Con event that was scheduled to take place in October will now be held virtually. Uh, The new all-digital convention as part of the Reed Pop's, quote, metaverse, will stream October 8th through 11th through uh, New York Comic Con's YouTube channel. 
like you said, Bill, this is no surprise at all. Conventions for all genres, not just Star Trek. They've been done virtually most of the year and probably will be for the foreseeable future. And although there has been no official word on any rescheduling or canceling of Star Trek Las Vegas, I won't be surprised when and if that announcement is made. I'm already not going if it's in December. I know that you are planning to if it's held, but it's it's such a big question mark right now. Well, uh, I have reservations. Yeah. Meaning I, I have a reservation at the hotel mm-hmm. and I have flight reservation. Whether or not I actually go is another story. Okay. Um, because it is now four months away or just, mm-hmm. just shy of four months away and um, nothing has gotten better. So mm-hmm. I can't see myself taking that kind of risk unless, like I said, unless the curve flattens like in two months. Risk is our business though, Bill. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> not in this. It, not not in this at eight. No, no, no. <laughs> so I, I have to imagine that STLV may not happen in December. And honestly, if I'm going to be uh, candid about it, I don't think it should happen in December. I I could not agree with you more. Uh, based on right now, we're in, we're in mid-August and stuff is still the way it is. I don't think any of these big events should be taking place. And I think it would be um, to the benefit of everyone if it was either held virtually or canceled all outright. And then we just meet in the desert next year. Yeah, I I say cancel it outright. Uh, Creation has been holding some virtual panels uh, independent of and superior to an STLV. You know, do something in March or schedule something for March, something smaller, you know, um, that people can go to if they want to. And then continue on with August for... Star Trek Las Vegas. So, um, or maybe do some smaller regional things. I don't know. Dan, we are more than halfway through the month of August and summer is starting to wind down, but our friends at Fanset certainly aren't. Oh, geez. You can say that again, man. They're like 24 seven. Or 26, 7 if you're on Bajor, right? How many days are in the Bajor week anyway? Do you know? I got nothing. Okay, anyway. Uh, yeah, of course, they are always hard at work to bring the very best pins to you, and their latest releases are no exception. Available right now at fansets.com is everyone's favorite Mako soldier, Major Hayes, from Star Trek Enterprise. And also available, Bill, finally, and I've been looking forward to this one for a long time, it's the DS9 slash Voyager slash First Contact version of the Starfleet Delta. It is absolutely gorgeous. And just to show you how dedicated to their customers' fan sets really is, they originally got this first shipment of com badges several weeks ago, but they didn't really like the way they came out. So what do they do? They shipped them all back and had them all redone because they want you to have the best possible product. And and they've just done a great job with that. Keep in mind, however, folks, that even though this is a full-size Delta, it is a pin, it's not a magnet, and it's not intended to be used as a cosplay piece. It doesn't matter, though. It's still gorgeous and is going to look awesome in your Fansets pin collection. So everyone, head on over to Fansets.com, put a bunch of pins and accessories and even gift certificates into your cart. Because remember, if you spend more than $30, you're going to get free shipping. Now, on top of that, for 15% off your entire order... Enter the exclusive Trek Geeks discount code for this week, BORG. That's B-O-R-G in all capital letters. This 15% off bonus code will be available to use from right now as we record uh, until Wednesday, August 26, 2020 at midnight Eastern Daylight Time. Fansets. Our pins have character. And we thank our friends at Fansets for being the presenting sponsor of Trek Geeks. Dan, as we (laughs) march forward in this episode... Uh, we, we gather now to talk about, um, really the, the cliffhanger that spans seasons three and four of Voyager. Yes. And that is of course, Scorpion, or as some might say, Scorpion. Well, oh, uh-huh. okay. Actually, no one would say that. I, would, I, just, I would think uh, maybe the, the chef from Little Mermaid might do that, you know, a little Renee, but that's okay. Renee Obertional, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Scorpion. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. This is an episode that we knew, um. It was going to bring some major changes to Voyager. Mm -hmm. We knew at some point we were going to say hello to a brand new cast member, goodbye to a current one. Yep. But there was a whole lot left in limbo as to who that person saying goodbye might be. Yeah, it it really was. This was a very controversial uh, decision that was made at the time. Um, The powers that be at Paramount really wanted to 
for all intents and purposes, to sex up the show. They wanted to bring in more younger male viewers, and they felt that by bringing in a character with a lot of sex appeal uh, back then um, would really bring in those listeners. So they decided to uh, bring in Jerry Ryan as this new character who would be a Borg who was um, uh, terminated from the collective and tried to integrate into the Voyager crew. And unfortunately, someone had to pay the price for that. And that was the character of Kess. And I know a lot of people, a lot of people love Kess. I have grown to appreciate her more than I have in the past. She's never been one of my favorite characters, but she was the one that was kind of put on the chopping block for those of you that watch the Food Network. And um, she's the <laughs> one that, uh, that had to say goodbye in uh, a couple episodes into season four. Well, in, in all honesty, that person leaving the ship could just as easily have been Harry Kim. Absolutely. Um, because at that point, I, I don't think they really knew that that what was on the table. Right. I, and and they really kind of let it – it could have been Harry Kim. We saw yeah. how he looked in sick bay at the end of that episode. He very easily could have died from the injuries he sustained from Species 8472. So there were a lot of questions. And back then, there wasn't a lot of the internets to be able to go about and, and get uh, information as to what was going to be happening in the upcoming season four. So uh, people were really – really had no idea what was going to happen until season four started. Well, the other thing we get in this particular episode is a, a new species that the Borg are terrified of. And that, that alone, it adds a new dimension. You know, you and I talk about how Voyager kind of took the Borg and made them something less than fearsome. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this adds a new context to the Borg. Um, it's rare that, you know, that species that looks to achieve perfection is terrified of something. Absolutely. And I got to say, um, on that note, one of the things I love most about the cliffhanger of season three is not only do we get the best teaser, I think, in Voyager with the mm. Borg cubes and in the middle of the sentence, resistance is futile, they are destroyed. But at the end of the episode, they have another bunch of Borg ships that get destroyed. So you have bookend Borg ship destruction in this episode. And you're like, who would have ever thought that anybody would be able to defeat the Borg as easily as this species does? And it, they they wipe through at one point in uh, in part two, which we'll get into. They wipe out like 300 ships in, in, yeah. in minutes. So, yeah, badass. It's really kind of amazing. You know, It, uh, I think that it added an element where that made fans sort of sit back and go, whoa. Because I remember watching that teaser um, while I was folding laundry <laughs> that week. I happened to turn on, you know, uh, UPN because I was home and um, I happened to be the season finale of Voyager. So I turned it on. I saw that cold open. And I'm like, damn. Yeah. <laughs> it's what was awesome. that? Yeah. You know, we always knew that Voyager would run into the Borg at some point. It was inevitable. Uh, we knew that they were from that quadrant. Um, and and the Borg were very popular, of course, with, with what was going on in TNG and and then first contact and everything. So we knew it was going to happen. And and that cold open is one of the most chilling scenes, uh, if not in Voyager, in Star Trek. You don't expect that to happen with what we know of the Borg. And this was kind of the first time in television, I think, that the Borg on TV were made to look as scary and eerie as they were in First Contact. Yes. You know, the earlier episodes on TNG, they they weren't they were menacing of course but their look was much different with the quote movie version of the borg and it was good to see that come into play here on voyager for the first time it's interesting to know that this almost wasn't the season finale um year of hell was actually almost the season finale for season yeah. 3 yeah. and i didn't know that until recently i i like it i like year of hell better where it was i do too um sort of mid season because i think it made sense to tell that story that way i think if i had to wait 3 months to find out what happened um, because of the Krenum time ship, I would have been like, are you kidding me? <laughs> um, but this one, I won't say it left me with the same feeling I had after Best of Both Worlds, but I certainly was left with, uh, what are they going to do now? Yeah, no, and let's be honest, nothing's going to leave us like we felt like with the Best of Both Worlds. Right. And, and never will because we don't have that, we have to wait a whole summer to find out what happens next type of thing. Kind of. Because we can stream everything, so um, I don't think the people, the youngsters of today, uh, appreciate what we went through back in the day. Uh, but you're absolutely right. It was like, 
Okay, so Voyager's stuck in a tractor beam, a whole bunch of Borg ships, and a Borg planet just got obliterated, and she's trying to make an alliance with the Borg. How are they ever going to get out of this one? I I was very excited. I, same here. You know, this is some great writing by both Brandon Braga and Joe Minoski. Um, I, I love a lot of Joe Minoski's work. He does some things which are a little outside the box um, all throughout Voyager and even with uh, with Star Trek Discovery when he was on that show for a brief time. But um, but this one really makes you think about the peril that is out there exploring the galaxy. Um, and well, let's let's just dive right in on Species Eight Four Seven Two. Sure. Um, uh, to say that they are fearsome and menacing is really a bit of an understatement. At least right now, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you did there. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, but this whole concept, you look at them and they look different than anything we've seen before. Um, you know, this this whole CG process, although very early on, sort of in that technology for mm-hmm. television really looks amazing. It really does look amazing. I was actually thinking of that today. I actually finished up watching part two at lunch today. And that's one of the things I talked about. They have some close-ups of Species 8472 when it's communicating with Kess. And it really looks great. The eyes, the blinking, the skin. You can actually see like different shades in the skin and lighting off of it. They really do a great job. And even that very first time we see one, when it jumps in on the Borg ship and scratches Harry... That's a pretty good. That's a pretty good job with CGI and as well as the actors acting out for, with something that's not there, which they probably weren't that used to doing back then. No, definitely. I mean, you know, they always look at blank space on the view screen and the you know the tennis ball with the blue dot that was yeah. there to to give them something to focus on. But I have to think it's much harder to fight something that's really not there. Right. I mean, they certainly did. Okay, so what year was this? 90, I can't even remember off the top of my head. Uh, 97. 97. When was the Gorn episode in Enterprise? Because the CGI in that is just so horrendous, but I think it was after, wasn't it? 2005. Oh my God. Wow. Okay, so somebody um, didn't watch this episode when they were doing the CGI. Anyway, forget (laughs) I said that. Um, I, I really like what they do in this episode. There's so much going on. There's so much darkness in this episode. One of the things that I was not used to seeing back then on television is the is the I don't know if gore is the right word, but you've got that pile of Borg body parts in the center of the cube that Kess is, is seeing. Then you've got, of course, what that awful thing that Harry goes through, and we see another Borg on the ship that's also going through that same thing with the tendrils and, yep. and being eaten from the inside out. Just the way the doctor said that is bone chilling. But this they really I think they really threw out all the um, all the ceilings for what they were going to do with this episode to really make it work so that you were really excited about what happened in part two. Well, and, and that's really it. I mean, you can't introduce a brand new character, a series regular, without having something huge to bring them on board. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, this ship is stuck, you know, 75 years from home. Um, it's not like they can just stop off on a plane and go, oh, you want to come with us? Yeah. Because they already did that once with Neelix. <laughs> Look where that comes <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> wow. I love Neelix now. And I do too, which is amazing. Yep. <laughs> um, but, you know, coming into this this area of space, you know, the the, the Northwest Passage, as that. they refer to it. Mm-hmm. Oh, I do too. Um, you know that they're coming right into the heart of Borg territory. It's like you said, this was bound to happen. But now the stakes are kicked up even more. Those premonitions that Kess has... Um, are those are chilling, man? Yeah, they're. Really when are. you consider that that pile of Borgs is really a pile of Borg action figures, <laughs> um, from Playmates, it, it's even more amazing because on screen it looks great, but it does. The whole concept of those premonitions is is really dark. It really is, and and I gotta I gotta give Jennifer credit. For, you know, I've I've been critical of her performance a lot, but it's unfortunate that in the last few times that we get to see her. She's really been able to do great with what she's given. And they finally gave her something to really work with, even though it was a small part in this two-parter. And, uh, and I like that she was, she was terrified, uh, especially in that one scene in sick bay where she turns around and she thinks that one of the aliens is there and she's like screaming and the doctor comes running over. I, I got to give credit to Jennifer Lee and for what she did for that. Well, and I have to give credit to her and, and honestly to Garrett, because I mean, you know, in Act Four, he's essentially just lying on a bio bed for the rest of the two-parter, <laughs> and that's—I mean, 
he's not doing a lot, but he's doing so much. You know, when at, at the end of Halloween, when you have a jack o' lantern out on your step and it's kind of getting all gross and kind of caving in on itself, <laughs> that's what his face reminds me of. That it's gross. It's just like all blah. <laughs> just it's like your that. face. There you go. I knew that. There was we good. go. I walked right into that rake. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I mean, already coming into the the later half of this first part, Voyager's not in a good place. Not at all. And then. They kind of encounter, oh, I don't know, 15 Borg cubes? Mm-hmm. 15. 15? Exactly. Um, uh, that's never happened before. High tailing it. Yeah. That, <laughs> what, what a great view that was on the, on the rear uh, angle of, the, of their uh, monitor, having 15 Borg cubes, and they just like ignore them completely. It was like, whew, okay. But what are they running from? <laughs> what, what are they running from? And now we know. Yeah. You know, it, it's this species that just sort of defies really everything about what we know of science. Mm-hmm. Um, and the doctor comes up with a very interesting solution. It really is interesting. And it, it's funny. I kind of, every time I see the, the little animation of the nanoprobe kind of like hooking onto the blood cell, I got to kind of laugh because it, is it really like it's just going up to a blood cell and hugging it and then it turns it gray? <laughs> It's kind of it's like a cute little nanoprobe, you know. I, I always thought that was kind of funny, but it, it's amazing that he does come up with that solution. And not to give away spoilers, because we're going to talk about part two, it works. It's it's really amazing, and of course, it's 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 a shame. Um, this is kind of my evil self coming out. It's yeah. a shame that this cure works for Harry as quickly as it does, because who doesn't love to see Harry Kim suffer? But by <laughs> Beginning of part two, he's already back on duty and everything's good, and he doesn't. He's got a tendril up his nose, according to Bellana, but that's besides the point. But it's kind of a cool. It's kind of a cool way to turn Borg technology to work for you. Which who would have ever thought that would be something that we would be looking to have happen? You know, and I don't think that that certainly the crew ever thought that would be the case. I think yeah. they're just hoping to get out of a Borg space, you know, with their lives intact, mm-hmm. knowing that they're the Federation's most deadly enemy, and then this. Yeah. And, and you know, before we go too far into it and then get into part two, I got to say one thing that is – it may be one of my favorite parts yeah. about this cliffhanger. The music in this episode is unbelievable. It is dark. It is eerie. There is no – fun or relaxing music in this episode at all except for the opening credits other than that it's always tense it's always foreboding it's always eerie and it always sounds as if something is about to happen and it becomes its own character in this episode it's like a horror movie uh the music is that good in this episode and i really want to give credit um to the people that did the score for this episode because it's fantastic. And I think it's available as like a standalone um, suite in one of the Star Trek uh, soundtrack albums out there somewhere. But it's it's something that I could listen to. The theme that they have for 8472 is really, really good. Yeah, no, I agree with that 100%. Yeah. Um, this episode uh, kind of comes to a – the first half, I should say, comes to a climax with Janeway sort of proposing – is something that you and I would have thought would never happen in a million years. And that's an alliance with the Borg against their new enemy using the doctrine of, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Given everything that we've known about the Borg to this time, I, I think going into it, watching it as a viewer, I'm like, she's crazy. Well, you know, back in the day, I would have thought that and probably yeah. did think that. But over the course of the last few years, and as we've appreciated Voyager a lot, and as we discussed just a couple of weeks ago with our friend Amy, the character of Janeway, she's capable of anything. And she's willing to think of all aspects of what she can do to get her crew home. And if coming up with an alliance is something that she thinks will work, I'm not going to shy away from it because it's coming from Janeway. And as we see, it, it kind of works. <laughs> <laughs> well, she and Chakotay have a rather uncomfortable conversation. Very in the briefing uncomfortable. Room. Yeah. Um, you know, where he tells her the, the parable of the scorpion, which mm-hmm. is where the episode gets its name from. And uh, ultimately, I mean, Chakotay is not wrong. No, he's not wrong at all. He, that's, he's, what, he's, that's, that's one of the best parts about this episode. Yeah. She's kind of not wrong because she's the captain and she has to do whatever mm-hmm. she can to get her crew home. But his job as first officer is to tell her when he thinks she's wrong. 
And he's not wrong. It's the Borg, for God's sake. Uh, so, yeah. Sorry to jump in on you there. No, totally okay. <laughs> um, but don't ever do it again. Um, <laughs> but, you know, a, a Chainway – I'm sorry. Chakotay says, you know, all right, you know, I'm going to comply with your orders. But uh, he, he essentially doesn't support her. No. Not privately. I mean, in front of the crew, he's going to do whatever um, – Whatever needs to be done, but she's and, not shaken by that one bit. And what a a deflating look and comment she gives to him. Then I guess I really am alone. Oh, 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 <laughs> yeah. Because as they've talked about, I mean, just just twenty minutes earlier, she's saying, "I didn't even know you a few years ago, but I can't think of going a day without you now." And then all of a sudden, and and he says, Catherine, you'll never be alone. Oh, guess what? <laughs> never mind. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and that I, you can, you know, you you gotta you gotta just think of how she felt hearing that from him, and then him saying her saying that to him, and then what he must have felt like after hearing it. Oh boy! Did you just oh boy me? Oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> so Janeway beams over to the cube. Yeah. Um, you get that, that, that wide shot behind her of just rows and rows and rows of drones in the mm-hmm. distance. And she starts talking about her demands. Um, they demand the technology immediately and Janeway is like, yeah, no, that's not happening. Nope. Not so much. Mm-hmm. Um, and they reach a, an agreement, which I never honestly at that point would have thought possible <laughs> now. Yeah. But then, like you said, not so much. You got to think, I, you got to you got to give her credit for really thinking on her toes. Well, I'll just delete all the data off the doctor and a doctor will be wiped away from memory. And you won't have anything and you'll be destroyed for, by species 8472. Oh, okay, oh. maybe we should listen to the captain a little bit, says the collective. Uh and got to give her credit for her ingenuity um uh, because it really it really shines here. And then of course the you know, eight bioships come out of the fluidic space and blow up a planet. You know, it happens. <laughs> Well, and they get away really in the nick of time, which sort of draws part one to a close. Yes. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the teaser for part two is a little longer, thankfully. A <laughs> um, lot happens even there. Um, and just the teaser alone, which is really kind of amazing. Um, some stuff is going down, suffice it to say. Um, Janeway's on the board cube. Mm-hmm. And calls back to Voyager and says, hey, guess what, guys? We're going to party with the Borg. We're friends. Um, we're friends. <laughs> we're going to do this. Um, we're teaming up. And uh, can you imagine being, I don't know, Ensign so-and-so on the bridge over at one of the engineering stations? <laughs> Boy, and, you know, you're, you're working on your warp field calculations. <laughs> and you hear Janeway on the main viewer going, yep, we've achieved an alliance with the Borg. And I would look up and go, excuse me? I, that's not what I would say. <laughs> we did what? <laughs> Boop. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we'd have to bleep that. Yeah, probably. Say what? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and you can see the look of the crew. They're all like, she's not serious, is she? But yeah, she's pretty serious. Yep. And to, and just to show that the Borg are all, all cuddly and friends now, they uh, just, you know, they shut off the tractor beam. Oh, you can just glide along with us. Right? I, I think that the whole time, if I were on board that ship, uh, I think I would have more anxiety than anything else because I'm worried that every time I turn a corner, I'm going to see a board drone. Yeah. And, um, well, that kind of comes to fruition. Oh. oh a a little? Tell, don't tell anybody. Oh, oh. <laughs> there so, all right, then we'll go back to sick bay then. Uh, okay. Oh. Bill, as usual, we love to talk about Science Division and our dear friends, Kaylee and Jay. Of course, they're the makers of the galaxy's first interactive Tribble that you can control with your smartphone. And of course, you can do that because, wait for it. But. No, 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 no. I said, wait for it. Because Tribbles are not dangerous, Bill. Right. (laughs) The Science Division Tribble is a must add to really any Star Trek fans collection. It doesn't just look great on your desk, though. I mean, these Tribbles seem so real. It's incredible. It's like they're straight off of Space Station K7. And remember, we said they're interactive. I mean, these things have three modes. There's at ease where they're happy and content. There's on duty, which is kind of a random mix of happy and angry sounds. And then there's also watchdog, where you can be sure that Klingon secret agents are close by. 
Now, you don't have to use the app to enjoy your Tribble, of course, but if you do, there's also an attack button which makes your Tribble scream on demand at friends, family, or even stupid co-hosts who do impersonations. <laughs> I didn't see that in the copy till just now. <laughs> uh, that was pretty good. Um, you know, you can buy your Tribble right now at sciencediv.com. And when it arrives, you can download the Section K7 app onto your iOS or Android phone, give it a name, and even choose what ship it's going to be assigned to. Plus, if you order your Tribble today, Science Division is giving Trek Geek listeners a special $5 off the adoption of your Tribble. So head on over to ScienceDIV.com to place your order. And then at checkout, be sure to enter the special code 8472. That's the numbers 8472, as in species 8472. That was for Bill because he's a little slow. Use that code and you're going to get $5 off your adoption now through August 26th. 2020 at 11 p 11 59 p.m eastern daylight time science division <laughs> troubles never been this fun and we thank our friends at science division for sponsoring this week's episode so the doctor has finished preparing a, a treatment for for ensign kim mm -hmm. um and he's got 10 million borg nanoprobes that he's modified um that's a lot of nanoprobes, and he just injects them into Kim, and they are immediately successful, which means I guess Harry's sticking around. He's sticking around. He's still an ensign, um, of course, um, but at least now he doesn't have um, what looks like gach all over his face because uh, and, and it dissolves right in front of us on camera. So the nanoprobes are doing their job, and I got to say, not to give spoilers away, but what happens to that, the way that the nanoprobes attack and defeat – what's going on in Kim's body. I like how they kept it to look kind of similar when they used the nanoprobes in the torpedoes against 8472 later on in the episode. Yeah. Even though it's a delayed reaction, they don't actually you know, get destroyed until they're just about to fire their weapon. But I like how they kept that similarity between the two. I thought that was good. No, I agree with you 100% there. Um, so we get that achievement. I mean, it's still not the Harry Kim that we started the show with. True. That's right. That's always going to be the case. Always going to be the case. Mm -hmm. He's still other Harry in my book. Other Harry. Harry too. <laughs> and nobody ever talks about that again. They don't. That's something you don't talk about, Bill. I thought that was Fight Club. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so Tuvok beams over to the cube and they get to meet Seven of Nine. They're sort of liaison, tertiary adjunct of Unimatrix Zero One. Thank you for completing the name. Uh, you're mm -hmm. welcome. Mm -hmm. And um, and she kind of is their connection to the collective. Yeah. Um, the, the the collective is wanting to work with them, but not so much because immediately they get neurotransceivers attached to them. <laughs> yeah. By the way, um, here, here, put this on. <laughs> but Janeway yeah. does what she does. Mm-hmm. I'll terminate the hollow matrix pro or whatever the program is, the doctor. <laughs> well, and you can already tell that 709 is going to be a little different because she says, I speak for the Borg, not we are the Borg, not we speak for the Borg, but it's the very declarative I. I have to wonder if that was a writing faux pas because later on in the episode, she always uses we. Right. That's really the only time I hear her say I, if I remember correctly. And I thought of that earlier because there was at one point where um, – um, they were able to uh, – something happened and, and the collective said to her, we need to take over the Alpha Quadrant vessel. And she goes, we understand. We will comply. Right. So I'm wondering, you know, was it there for drama or was it an actual goof? We'll never know, but uh, I, it works, you know? No, I agree with you. It's a great moment. I mean, you know, if, if you're going to introduce a character, that is a uh, – that's a great standalone line. Mm -hmm. um, and plus it makes you wonder – I know while I'm watching it at this point, you've heard about the cash shakeup back in 97. You're wondering, all right, well, is she going to be a Borg the whole time? At this point, my brain's going, um, how's this going to work? Yeah. And, you know, as you were saying that, I just thought of it. Locutus introduced himself with an I also. I am well, Locutus a Borg. He did, but he was also, I mean, designed to be, you know, something very different. He was designed um, to be the spokesperson for the Borg with the Enterprise, but this yeah. is exactly what Janeway wanted. She wanted someone to speak for the Borg for this mission. Um, I, I'm just, I just, it just no, I agree. Head. Yeah, so, but still, usually we in every other sentence. Absolutely. Yep. So, yeah, um, it's a great moment, though. It is a great moment. I gotta say, uh, Seven of Nine has a huge metal pole upper button this whole episode. 
She's got an attitude problem. <laughs> well, it could be because of all that Borg stuff on her face. <laughs> that, that is a lot of Borg stuff. That's a lot of Borg stuff. it's funny that you say that because a little tangent. Today I watched a video on StarTrek.com of – of uh, Ms. Ryan uh, getting the Borg uh, makeup put on her for Picard. And it's just the eyepiece and the hand and a little thing on her cheek. And it's like, okay, how long did it take to make her a full Borg? Because that's a lot of stuff. It and really it looks, is. It's awesome. It really is. Well, and, and the transformation she goes from, I mean, okay, they have to right away to make her look human mm -hmm. and, and hot because yeah. that was the goal, as you yep. stated earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and to know that she starts off like a drone like this. Um, with all that makeup and all that, that heavy Borg appliances, it's like, yeah. man, yeah. It, if those were her first few weeks on set, can you imagine Jerry sitting in, a, in the makeup chair going, what the hell am I doing? What did I sign up for? What now I, I know what Andy for? Robinson's talking about. <laughs> 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 but I, so, I got to say, it's funny that a lot of Borg in the first contact version and everything we've seen up through Picard – their eyepieces are just these really freaky things that just, oh, they make you just squirmish because they're in your eye. Hers is no different. That thing is, that sucker is giant and it looks like it really hurts. And she's got a screw in, in the corner right here where her eyebrow meets her nose. It's an Stop actual it. screw there. I saw it. It was gross. Stop it. <laughs> um, so, um, so the Alliance, uh, shaky ground at best. A little bit. Continues to get shakier. Uh, the captain and Tuvok come back to sick bay. Um, Chakotay decide. Go ahead. I was going to say that's a very good point. That's one thing that I did not expect in this episode is for the Borg to put themselves in harm's way not once but twice in succession when they get in front of the energy beam that's firing on Voyager, and then when they purposely ram the uh, bio ship. Mm -hmm. And destroy it and the cube. Who would have ever thought the Borg would sacrifice himself for the good of the Alpha Quadrant vessel? Even though it's for the nanoprobes, but you know what I mean? Well, I think it's because at the end, the Borg are thinking, well, we're just going to assimilate them anyway. Oh, that's true too, um, yeah. <laughs> resistance is futile and all that garbage. <laughs> um, but like I said, the, the shaky alliance becomes much shakier. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Chakotay essen uh, essentially tells the senior staff he's going to dissolve the alliance with the Borg. Even though they're kind of on board. On board? <laughs> Sorry. I hate you so much right now. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, the Borg want to go back to the Borg. Big shock. And Chakotay's like, yeah, I'm going to think about it. Yeah. But then At that point, he's the, done. But then you see the pain on his face when he tells an unconscious captain in sickbay about what he's about to do. So you know he's oh, torn. Yeah. You know he's torn, but he's he's – He's in command. He's going to do what he thinks is best. Is he thinks is best, even if it's going against what Catherine specifically said. And if I may, let me back up for a second, Bill, because the sick base scene made me think of it. Yeah, one ahead. of the most gut wrenching parts of episode two is right before Catherine is is put into a coma by the doctor, and she's talking to Chakotay about how important the alliance is, and the way she says, "Get this crew home," is. It's it's it, it makes it makes you tear up because that's when you really see how important it is to her and the guilt that she feels for stranding them there and what she will do anything to get them home. I thought that was that was a beautiful scene with uh, with Kate Mulgrew. No, you're right, and and, and Beltran's pretty great in that scene too. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it just it further reinforces why we love Janeway mm -hmm. um, because. Uh, because that is her reaction. Here she is. She's about to go in a coma. She has no idea if she's going to make it out. Right. Her last order to Chakotay is get the crew home. Right. And if you don't feel that in the pit of your stomach, it's like, I, I don't know. Right. Because that's that's a great, great moment. Heartless. <laughs> your <laughs> face is heartless. <laughs> yeah. um, to say that there's a little bit of tension between Chakotay and Seven is not untrue. Mm-hmm. And it's Hard so to believe- that these two characters get together in the finale. I was going to say it's a different tension later on in the, in the series, but we want to talk about that right now. <laughs> no. No. Um, but you want to talk about sort of two, you know, an immovable force and an unstoppable, or sorry, unstoppable force and an immovable object. Yeah. That's kind of the relationship that Chakotay and Seven have right now. And I got to give it to Beltran. He does great standing up to her. He, oh, yeah. really, he is not budging and he's not scared or he doesn't show it. 
and he has no problem putting her in his place. And he really kind of does put her in her place as the spokesperson for the collective. I thought was I thought it was great. Uh, Chakotay even um, you know sort of takes some some real definitive action. Um, you know when the the Borg start uh, working in Cargo Bay two. Um, uh, the collective updates them on the status of the war. Um, and they, you know, start, uh, forcing the human's hand by seizing control of Voyager. And Chakotay's like, yep, nope. Decompress the shuttle bay <laughs> or the, uh, the cargo bay. I mean, yeah. Good special Which effect. Is, oh, that is great. Mm-hmm. Um, and pretty much all the Borg are gone except, well, the one that's going to stay in the crew. Oh, wasn't that convenient? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. She holds on tenaciously. Yes. That's memory alpha wow. size. Tenaciously. And Tenacious. she pushed her, I like how she's slipping along the Jeffrey's tube with her hands, but put her put her foot up against the opening of that Jeffrey's tube and she's all set. She got Borg <laughs> technology, baby. Jamie Summers got nothing on her. <laughs> she got uh she got Borg <laughs> shoes. Borg shoes. Magnetically uh, you know, whatever. I was just gonna say really good traction. Oh, okay. That works too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um so some stuff happens. Mm-hmm. Does. I, we're condensing a lot because this is a it's a one hour podcast for a two hour episode, and there's a lot going on. There's a lot. There is so much going on. Mm-hmm. You know, when you think back on these episodes and you watch it again, you don't really realize how much they threw in here until you rewatch it again with a more critical eye. And so much happens in this second part that there really are no wasted moments. There really aren't. There's we could spend twenty minutes just going over the list of stuff. So, I mean, just little things like. Getting Voyager Borgified, which just the little areas of the ship that – why the Borg stuff always green? But it's green stuff showing up on the ship. And I got to tell you, a little shout out to our friends at Eagle Moss. The Borg, the Borg enhanced Voyager ship is pretty awesome. So buy it. Um, but lots of stuff going on. They get the they get the torpedo set. All of a sudden, they're in fluidic space, which is kind of yep. gross. Decon chamber on discovering Trek lower decks. Um, <laughs> but uh, great weapons that work. Um, Kess is talking with the aliens some more. All kinds of things. And Janeway's got something up her sleeve, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> really, Dan? Yeah. What's that? Scorpion. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, uh, well, no. Let, let's build on that because I mean we're yeah. we're we're close to sort of the end of the episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, essentially, um, she does have something up her sleeve, um, and really, there's kind of been something up the whole crew sleeve the whole time. Really, if you think about it, yeah. Um, it it, it really takes a, a rather definitive end to this particular conflict. It really does, and I, I got to say that they do a great job. It's kind of too bad that Seven is oblivious to what's going on. She just seems fine with, oh, oh, you put Chakotay in the brig? Oh, all right. That's okay. So good. I'm going to trust you now, Captain. And we're going to, we're going to defeat these, uh, these ships and we're going to return to space. And then I'm going to cancel our deal. And yeah, I'm going to assimilate you. So stand by. And then she goes and puts the tubules into the console. I did like the fact that they showed, which we don't get to see nearly enough, uh, someone firing a phaser at the Borg and having their, body shield show up. Yeah. That's always cool to see. Um, but yeah, so th- it was all an act because I can't for the life of me remember the episode where where Chakotay was connected to the collective, but I'm going to have to go find it because uh, if it wasn't for that, that just wouldn't have happened. <laughs> no, that's true. Um, th- that happened in season three, right? I don't remember it. I got to I gotta find it and rewatch it. I don't think it. you remembered it when we did the theater skip it. Uh, probably not. Was that the one? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh, yeah, he he found the uh, uh, the the the. Uh, I guess we can call them XBs, like they do in Picard, who oh, I like that. kind of form their own collective. Oh, is that the episode that that happens? Yeah, I remember I that so. episode. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I like that episode. I just forgot that he was attached to the collective. Um, one of the the most interesting parts of that whole sequence, the Scorpion sequence, as, as I like to call it, is just the the agony that that Jerry Ryan plays on the link to the collective being severed Mm -hmm. you know immediately you see true actual physical pain on her face i think it's it's played beautifully you understand what that means simply as a star trek fan but you don't understand necessarily what it means in the scope of 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 her being part of the collective we've seen a little bit with hugh but not really because he was injured at the time but she is forcibly removed from the collective and it's 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 gut-wrenching and we see later on through season four and, and into season five and maybe even the rest of the series how difficult that really is for Seven to be 
alone. I think there's an episode, isn't it, called Alone or something like that, where she's alone and she's really having trouble. Uh, it's when the one where the, all, the, all the crew has to go to sleep and she's the only one on board and she's really having a hard time because she's not with the collective and she doesn't have anyone around her. I think it's called One. One. Thank you. One alone. Same thing. It's like me when I'm podcasting. That's how I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, we we do see that later. But yeah, that that's a that is a physical severing of the connection, and it it looks like it hurt. Um, and even though we don't see her conscious again this episode, and we don't see her more human, we know just by the ominous way that the camera goes in on her in sick bay as the episode ends that things are just starting. They really are. And it sets this character off on really the most uncertain footing, probably more uncertain than any Star Trek series regular has ever had. Um, you know, because she's lying on the, on the bio bed in the sick bay and she's kind of unconscious. And it's like, yep, that's the episode. Yep. And that's never happened with a show regular before. So this is a really interesting introduction. She has a, a really, uh, she has great potential in this journey to do so much and we're just scratching the surface because we honestly don't know what's going to happen next. Is she going to look like this for four and a half years? Yeah. We don't know. Right. It's the unknown, uh, as a lot of Star Trek shows talk about. And I really think that the way that they played this up – see, because when you think about it, there's no mention of her. There's nothing about her in the entirety of episode one. And I have to apologize because I think when we were doing an episode a couple of weeks ago, I talked about how we briefly saw her introduced in Scorpion part one, which is completely not the case. We don't actually see right. her until 10 minutes into episode uh, Scorpion part two. Right. Um, so we have no idea what this is going to be like. Then we get her. Then we see that she's Borg and then she's going to help the crew and then she's going back on their word and is going to try to assimilate everybody. Then she's severed from the collective, and then we just see her laying unconscious, vulnerable, but we have no idea what she's going to be like when she wakes up. Well, and it gives Jerry and Ryan a great place to start with from this character, because she truly is starting at the beginning of Seven's yeah. humanity, or her discovery right. of humanity. Mm -hmm. Something that that character's never known. So I really think that's that's pretty great as far as, uh, as, as being an actor has to is concerned, I, I have to believe. Clean slate to work with, yeah. Clean slate. Um, so... Scorpion, um, probably one of my all-time favorite Voyager episodes, quite frankly, nice. um, because of so much. You know, it's there's a lot on the line. The stakes are, yeah, it's, it's the cliche, the stakes are high. Mm -hmm. um, but they really are in this sense. And I, I think that for me, this is probably my favorite Voyager two-parter. Oh, really? I did yeah. not know that. Okay. Uh, your hell is mine, obviously. I mean, it's one of my favorite Voyager episodes at all. But this one's really up there. There's, Like you said, there's a lot going on. And another thing that's really good with this two-parter, Bill, is the, the story. When you think about the story of the Scorpion, it really plays into everything that goes on from the time that story is told to the captain all the way to the end of the episode. Mm. And it's it's great to use something like that, 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 that children's story that Chakotay heard. And how important it is when they're 70,000 light years from home, looking at certain destruction by either one force or another, and they got to figure out a way to get through it. And they do. It's pretty awesome. And then they use it against the Borg with the whole Chakotay marble thing on his neck, talking to Anakin. Anakin, <laughs> Anakin, Anakin, where did, An whoa, Anakin, sorry. Wow. Crossing of the streams. Um, <laughs> you're about to get fired from this podcast. Um <laughs> Because uh, unlike some networks, we only talk about Star Trek. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah. Yeah. I see what you did there. So, um, so starts the, the life of Seven of Nine aboard Voyager. Mm -hmm. and, um, we may have a bit of a dive in on that next week, but that's next week. Um, yeah. You know what I was going to say? We didn't talk about it. and I don't, actually. We haven't talked about Leonardo da Vinci at all. And it's it's not... A super important part to the story, but I do like, of course, that we got to see John Rice Davies. That's always great to see him. This is an important thing for Catherine. It is is being able to go in there and and just and even at the end of part two, she goes in there just so she can get away from technology and fluidic space and all these other things. And I really like how they 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 bookmarked that. You know what's interesting to me? This is about the fourth or fifth time this episode you referred to Captain Janeway as Catherine, and not the Captain or Janeway. I'm trying to mix it up. Purposely. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure yeah, if maybe yeah. it's because of the connection you feel to the character or... 
That could um, be it too. I was actually going to call her Katarina, but I didn't want to overdo it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like you don't go around calling Picard Jean Luc, and you don't go around calling yeah. Kirk Jim. I, you know what? The more I think of it, I did it purposely tonight, but I I feel really comfortable calling her Catherine, and I think that's because of the amount of respect that I have for her and for Kate for what she's done yeah. with this character. I just love it so much, and 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 to me, it seems more personal. And it's, you know, because it's somebody I care about, even though it's a fictional character. I, so calling her by her first name, I like it. Well, let's be honest. It's because you want to build her a bathtub. And Dan, <laughs> there are some other humans on this planet for which I know you'd like to build a bathtub. And that's our friends, the band Five Year Mission, <laughs> uh, without whom this podcast would sound just non-musical. Um, we are so grateful to the, the band for allowing us to use their music, not only here on Trek Geeks, but all over the network. Um, we love Five Year Mission, and we love them so much that they now have a podcast on our Trek Geeks Network called "Wait for This." Five Year Mission, the podcast. Get out! I know, I know. No, no. It's, it's no, get out. Oh, all right, hold okay. on. <laughs> um, but so yeah, head on over to fiveyearmission.net. Get all their CDs in your hand because as great as it is to listen on Spotify or some other service, um, bands don't really see a great amount of uh, of benefit from that. So. What really helps them? Buy their CDs. Get the physical media. Yep. You know, become a huge fan of them because we are. That's fiveyearmission.net. Go get all their albums. Year one, year two, year three, year four, Trouble with Tribbles, Spock's Brain, and year five, soon, sometime. Well, maybe. We'll have to get, maybe Fark will give us an update on that sometime soon. But yeah, awesome music. We use it on all our uh, all our pod. We just we just love them. Uh, but Bill, I got to say, you know, you know who else I love? I don't. I love- I love Julian Bashir, secret agent. Oh, I gotta say, I really do. He's one our of the man best. Bashir. Our man Bashir, one of the best secret agents out there. He faced danger at almost every turn. He wooed the most beautiful women on the planet. Uh, he was suave and and debonair, even when the music was at its bleakest because of drummers that really weren't that good. He fought evil because he knew it was the right thing to do, Bill, and. No one was evil than this particular person. The man who enunciated better than any villain in history. And he had an interesting philosophy. Oh, no. He uh, Yeah, it was an interesting one. There comes a time when a house has become so damaged by drummers that you must not only kill the drummers, but demolish the house. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. Dr. Evil had nothing on this guy. Nothing. His name... Hephaerkrates Noah. Ha! Oh man, a uh, l- little bit. No, not Come even on. a little. Oh, that's hey, just. Y'all. Although I can't wait for Fark to change his his Twitter <laughs> name to that. Yes. Oh, that'll be beautiful. Um, Hephaerkrates Noah. Mm-hmm. I said it, and you said it just now. <laughs> actually, I know. So I you. feel I feel dumber <laughs> for it. Actually. Dirty or dumb, one or the other. Yeah, one of the two. I, I feel like I sold my soul. But that's fiveyearmission.net. Please go get all their albums. Of course, don't forget, you too can support the Trek Geeks Podcast Network by subscribing to bonus content on Patreon. You can get all kinds of of other perks, Dan. It's, it's really amazing. There's laptop stickers, there's t-shirts, and there is our unparalleled annual supporters pin which we produce with our friends at fansets which i think you might be holding in your hot grubby little actually, hands actually yeah today i got a text from a friend of mine from fansets our good friend john he goes um i just got a message that the package was delivered so can you check out the pins and let us know out what they look like and i'm like say what so i went downstairs and sure enough there was a box of our patreon year two supporter pin and dude this thing is unbelievably gorgeous and i give you all the credit in the world you came up with this one buddy it is absolutely spectacular it's got our logo it's got the coconut planet it's got all of our all of our shows written on this pin which is just amazing detail and um if you want this pin you got to become a patreon member i'm just going to say that right now so um you know i'm going to tease you about it and you're not going to get one unless you join the Patreon. <laughs> well, so. I'm going to get one because I, I designed it. <laughs> okay, you can have one. Uh, but, oh, but thank it. you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, they're they're absolutely beautiful, and and we're very proud of them. So, uh, so yeah, check them out. And um, right now, though, we want to take a moment to thank our associate producers uh, for Trek Geeks. They're all getting pins. Um, we are so grateful for their support. So, thank you, Dave Andrews, Vikram Bot, Luke Burnham. 
Brad DeMag, William Edward M. Jr., Brandon Everidge, Andy Fark, Kimberly Francis, Jonathan Hamilton, Brooke Horton, Ryan Jeffs, John Krikorian, Sean Lynn, Jamie McGregor, Aaron Mollenkoff, Shane Murray, Tim Robertson, Greg Rozier, Eric Sakian, Adam Sanders, Tim Sardar, Heather Sohn, Lisa Tomlinson, Jessica Dax Vincent, Trey Womack, Ron Robel, and the gracious and wonderful Conrad Hutchins. <laughs> that gets more gracious and more wonderful every week. Every um, week. Every week. <laughs> uh, Dan, of course, we want to thank our Trek Geeks producers as well for their support. They are Mike Bovia, Chaz Bradshaw, Ken Bird, Kyle Castillo, Peter Craig, Rachel Delaney, Craig Ewing, Jackie and Chris Hackney, Kimberly Hartman, David Hood, Steph Lescu, Lionel Marchand, Matt McGonigal, Jim McMahon, Charlie Mulvey, Sean O'Halloran, Jamie Rogers, Casey Shafsky, Chris Trebuzio, Ken Tripp, Christina Werther, and the lovely and talented Jess Fashon. You too can become a producer on the Trek Geeks Network, and it is just so easy to do. Head on over to patreon.com slash trekgeeks for all the details. Well, Dan, next week, Voyager 25 continues with a discussion about a character that um, came in for controversial reasons, but became a beloved fan favorite. Absolutely. And we talked about her a lot just in the last hour. Um, the, the powers that be wanted to make Voyager more sexy, so they introduced this new character uh, in the very episode that we discussed, Scorpion. So next week, we're going to dedicate the entire show to everyone's favorite Borg and discuss her introduction, her humanity, and her part as a valued crew member of Voyager, as well as her unexpected and wonderful return in Picard. It's Seven of Nine, tertiary adjunct of Unimatrix Zero One, next week on Trek Geeks, the flagship of the Trek Geeks Podcast Network. Um, it's going to be a great discussion next week. Uh, we're looking forward to it. Um, lots uh, to talk about with Seven of Nine, including lots of brand new stuff. So that's yeah. next week, right here on the flagship. Of course, for more great Star Trek discussion, please check out the other member podcasts of the Trek Geeks Podcast Network. You can find them all, including where to listen, by visiting trekgeeks.com slash listen. The Trek Geeks Podcast Network, no one talks Trek like we do. And of course, for all the news on all the Star Trek CEO, please visit our great friends at treknews.net. For now, this has been episode number 229 of the Trek Geeks Podcast. We do hope you all live long and prosper. Get this coconut home. Uh, no. Music for Trek Geeks is provided by Five Year Mission. They're writing an original song for each episode of Star Trek. Hear more of their music at fiveyearmission.net. Trek Geeks is a production of Coconut Media Works. Executive producers Bill Smith and Dan Davidson. For more great Star Trek discussion, discover the other shows of the Trek Geeks podcast network at trekgeeks.com or find us in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Bing bong. Bing bong. <coughs> Bing bong. I'm not sure which one I like better. Ruck. More complex than brown. No, probably the other one. No? You like the other one better? All right. Yeah, your tone was really good this week. Thanks. That's because I, you know, I, I've been practicing. <laughs> yeah. 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 I see you in front of the mirror going, in the shower. Bing bong. I'm in the shower. Bing bong. No. I don't want to know what you do in no. the shower. <laughs> That's okay. Hey, I bought a hot tub. What? Yeah. Soon I bought a hot tub today. <laughs> what? Yeah. You know what? COVID's going on. You know, we don't have the camp anymore. We can only go there once a year. You know, we don't know if we're going to find a place on a lake that we really want so much. So we figured, you know what? Let's just bring the water to us. So uh, Wow. Yeah. Talk about burying the lead. This is the first time I'm hearing about it. I know. I wanted to surprise you and get your reaction on air, so to speak. So, I, am, uh, it's, I am stunned. And uh, we're pretty excited about it. You know, Chris and Donna used to have one years ago, and we really liked it. They got rid of it, and they're actually thinking about getting one again because they really miss it. 
And we said, you know what? What's what's stopping us from getting one right now? I mean, we got the spot for it. We got a perfect spot out in the back for it. It's gonna. It's uh, so we went and we went out to the seacoast last weekend and visited uh, mainly tubs. Little plug for them. And uh, the salesperson was fantastic. And we said, let's do it. So it's not going to see. The problem is though, um, everybody's buying them right now because everybody's stuck at home. Oh so right. It's it's, it's not going to be available and delivered till October, but at least we'll have it. So uh, we're we're really excited about it. So, wow, well that's pretty cool. Yeah, it should be fun. It's got and lights, and we got the, we got like Bluetooth speakers in it and everything. <laughs> now, now will you use it in the winter time? Yes, absolutely. Nice. Yeah, nice. absolutely, we will. And uh, we're thinking at some point we may get some kind of a. They have these really great um, covers for it that actually it's mechanical and it, it's it's down low and it, the cover is on the tub. But the legs all rise up and the cover goes up with it. So it's like a gazebo when it's raised up full. And so, then you get in the tub and do it and, you know, you're in the tub and then you lower it and the cover goes back on. It's kind of cool. We might so get that someday. I have two questions. Hmm. At what point does it become like Bumblebee and head off to fight the Decepticons? Anyways. No. And uh, at what point will you get trapped under that cover? <laughs> <laughs> Purposely? <laughs> no. No of your own luck. <laughs> My own luck. That's probably bound to happen at some point. I I, I don't know. Bumblebee? Uh, I think I'd rather go with Optimus Prime. <laughs> I like yeah, that. I know you. You're not Optimus Prime. <laughs> well, I, I, I sat in Optimus Prime. And so uh, did you. I did. We did. We sat yeah, in Optimus uh, Prime on the Paramount fun. lot. Yes, we did. Yeah, so we're, we're excited. Um, uh, It'll be a... a a couple of months away, but you know, I got a project. I got to dig the spot and put crushed stone in it and all that stuff. But yeah, so maybe one day I can broadcast live from the hot tub. Oh yeah, because that's not rot with peril. I'll just put a little table on the side. It'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Uh, knowing you. Yeah. <laughs> You'll be like, yay! Finally. Oh my god, that's an option. <laughs> yep. Yep. So. Um. Do you plan on toasting any bread near your hot tub? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Wow. No? Uh, no? No, no, I don't think so. so wow, look who got dark. Sorry about that. Yeah, that's all right. So how's your day, pal? <laughs> uh, my day does not involve a hot tub. That's for damn sure. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, I guess that's I'm a lucky one with that. Um, well, that's largely because we rent. Oh, that's true too, yeah. yeah. Um, and... Um, you know, my, my wife, uh, I don't think she's really big on hot tubs. And that's fine because I'm not either. In my younger years, I wasn't. But as an older person who has problems with his knees and problems with his shoulders and problems with his lower back, when we've gone to Disney and gone in the hot tubs down there, it was just like, oh, my God, this is so good. So I can see the benefit as an older person to get that relaxation on the muscles. So I'm looking forward to it. I just realized you're just under a month away from a Shut birthday. Up. Yeah. You're going to be another year older. I right, thank you. Well, not from now. I won't be a year older, but from my last birthday, I will be. That's what I mean. Okay, just making sure. You're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fifty-one. I'm not afraid to say it. I don't, I don't know why people have a problem when they people ask you their age. You're like you can't ask that question. Sure, you can. Squad fifty-one, KMG three six five. Oh wow! <clears throat> nice. Thank you. Big emergency fan. Big emergency fan. Yep. It's funny because you can find that on like um, on I think it's on Cozy. And rewatching that show is is not engaging television. It's her- horrible. It's like I gotta say it. I don't even know if I've talked to you about this. We were flipping through the stations like two months ago at night, and on one of those old stations, the Six Million Dollar Man first episode was on. The first episode, that episode sucks so bad today. Now, was it the Population <laughs> Zero episode, or was it the two-hour It was the one where movie? he actually goes, the two-hour movie where he goes okay. up and crashes, and then he's in the hospital, yeah. and the camera's shaky, and all they do, they spend 20, sec- 20 seconds like with the camera on his EKG monitor, and then they'll flip to him sleeping, and then they'll flip to the nurse taking readings on her tablet. It's like, oh my God, this is so bad. It's so but cute you then, think they had tablets back then. <laughs> Well, her writing tablet, I should say. <laughs> but it's like, oh, we're, we didn't even finish it. We both looked at each other. Finally, I think it was at midnight. We're like, we're not watching any more of this. Let's go. Yeah. 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 The Bionic Woman gets a better start than the $6 million man does, honestly. Although then you get Steve Austin singing, Jamie. Jamie. Ooh. I, I remember That's, the day I sent that to you. Oh, my you God. Like, oh, my God. <laughs> So for those of you who who may not have seen it in quite a while or have never seen it, The Six Million Dollar Man with Lee Majors, 
uh, when they introduced the bionic woman played by Lindsay Wagner, um, there are times where Lee Majors sings Mm -hmm. as Steve Austin uh, in sort of voiceover. And um, to say that Lee Majors is not a great singer is probably an understatement. And that's even saying with the Fall Guy theme is gold record compared to what he sings on in the Six Million Dollar Man and Bionic yeah. Woman. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I'm not the kind of guy who kiss and tell, but he was seen with Farrah. But, well, it's like because he was married to her and she dropped his ass. That, that's true. Yes, absolutely. Did I say that out loud? I don't know if you did, but it's also funny that in the episode – uh, that or in the movie with the Bionic Woman, she dies. But then when they made it a TV series, she didn't die, and they brought her. You know, they saved her, and she became the Bionic Woman because right. her Bionics rejected uh, in the movie, and she went crazy and died. Right. Yeah. Um, by the way, Population Zero is the actual episode one of season one of the series. Six months. Oh, okay. Earlier. All right. Um. Yeah, not a bad episode. And then you get into Day of the Robot. In episode four, which is just fantastic. I think that's the one with John Saxon. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Just recently passed away, didn't he? Uh, yeah, just last yeah. week. Yeah. Um, and if it's not that one, then it's a different one with – oh, no, that is with John John Saxon. Okay. That's a great, great episode of Six Six Million. Of course. Any of the ones with the Fembots and John Houseman are awesome. The Bigfoot one's awesome. The Death Probe one scared the bejesus out of me when I was a kid. I and watched then that. They, they yeah. hurt his arm. I was like, oh, God, it's the arm. Did you used to run in slow motion in the backyard when you were a kid? Like totally. A, okay. Just want to make sure. Um, now – uh, fans uh, of Star Trek um, would probably want to know that William Shatner is in episode 11 of the first season of Six Million Dollar Man. Oh. Um, uh, playing a, an astronaut who's uh, really been affected by a, a mysterious electrical field during his last spacewalk. Oh. So Steve Austin is called in to evaluate his sanity. And mm-hmm. uh, well, as you can imagine, some stuff happens. Absolutely. John DeLancey's in Six Million Dollar Man, if I remember correctly. As yeah, a, but it's as a, a bit part. Bit part, yep, yep. Uh, a couple of times. He's oh, in one of the Bigfoot once. episodes as like a, an Air Force airman. Oh, okay. All right. Um, but it's it's not uh, – I think he I maybe has a line. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. But uh, Shatner gets the top guest star billing in, in episode 11 of, of Six Million. So That's cool. Awesome. Uh, Memories, the se- babe. The series that I used to fight to watch every night at 6 o'clock when my brother wanted brother. to watch Star Trek. Yeah. Yeah. I used to, I used to love that show, but now it, it just does not stand up. Um, I think there are some episodes that that do. Um, there are aspects of of it that I forgot about, like his bionics didn't work in cold weather very well. Oh, and they would go. <laughs> yes. So, like in episode eight, where uh, rescue of Athena one, where he has to go to space to to help rescue uh, Farrah Fawcett. Mm-hmm. Um, his bionics don't work very well. He has to go up to Skylab. Ah, <laughs> Skylab. <laughs> wow. Okay, that's pre-79, obviously. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's like, what, 74, I think? Oh, wasn't that? Uh, yeah, 74. 74, really? Wow. Yep. Okay. It's a good uh, four years or so before Skylab fell to Earth. Okay, so totally different topic because we're talking about things in the past. Yeah. I got to point it out tonight. I think I think our friend Haley talked about it on Twitter. But Sue and I watched on the Disney Channel tonight before we came up and recorded the Mount St. Helens documentary. You have got to watch this. Every single person listening right now, you have got to watch this documentary. It is unbelievable. So good. How some of these people walked away from being in the blast zone just is something I cannot even comprehend. It was an amazing documentary, and they've got new high-res recreations of photographs and everything like that. It's amazing the amount of power that came out of that thing. It really is. Yeah, it really is a great, great 45 minutes. So there you go. Wow. On that note, um, I suppose we should uh, get this thing started. Scorpion. You know, if if you were the fox and I was the scorpion, I wouldn't sting you. I would sting you several times. Like sting, 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 sting. If I were the fox, I would have known not to go anywhere near you because you're a GD scorpion. (laughs) GD. Are you ready to do this? I'm ready. Let's do it. All right. Coconut. <laughs> 